Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking about the county bailing on promises made to the city, the dozens of wrongful convictions caused by the Oregon DMV, and how Portland's police chief is asking his officers to stop talking smack about the district attorney. Joining me today are Willamette Week's City Hall reporter, Sophie Peel, and our very own audio producer, Julia Fiaioni. It's Friday, August 11th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Sophie, Julia, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. You know, um, I get a lot of emails. I'm like bragging here. I get a lot of emails from listeners. Uh, <laughs> but most of them, though, are to tell me that I've mispronounced something or said something wrong, which I still appreciate. Um, this one email I received from Becca Lee this week, it very sweet, was like, good morning, aloha is pronounced aloha, no H sound. Did you guys know this? It's aloha, Oregon, not aloha, Oregon? No. I did, but I think I had to learn it the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Becca Lee uh, was very sweet about it, but it made me wonder why we say Aloha and not Aloha when it is clearly spelled Aloha. And I just got kind of tired of being gaslit by Oregon pronunciations of things. And so I went down a little a little rabbit hole and I just wanted to share with you real quick that according to lore, this is again, this is like my cousin said this history, but according to the the story is that Aloha was named after a resort on Lake Winnebago in Wisconsin, which is after like the indigenous word there for hello, which is also kind of ironic because aloha also means hello, whatever, and goodbye. But um, so, but it's spelled A L O A H, aloha, and somehow in, you know, the years of writing it, it became aloha, but everyone knew that it was aloha. But then I was just like, well, then why are we saying Willamette and not like Willamette or Willamette, or <laughs> which is what I <laughs> thought it was when I first moved in? <laughs> Did you guys know to immediately say Willamette? I think I just avoided saying it until I heard other people say it a few times. So it stuck immediately. But God knows what I would have said if I gave it a <laughs> test run before I heard it. <laughs> I like Willamette. I think I think that's nice. That's very romantic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Willamette. <laughs> I think it's the hard A that really gets me. The like Willamette, you know, right. it just feels a little. We're kind of butchering it. Well, the impression you get when you see Willamette spelled out is that it's a French word, so it should be Willamette. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. oh, Willamette. Um, but it's <laughs> actually Willamette, and it's derived from a native word from the region that originally translated to like water or, or river or whatever and it's Willamette like that's how you spell it but no one liked the way it looked because it would be w-a-l-l-a-m-e-t if you want to say Willamette mm. and so I guess the spelling looked too low class and so they Frenched it up <laughs> <laughs> no way yeah that's hilarious all I'm saying is that I feel like I'm being gaslit by English all the time as like a person mm -hmm. who speaks another language. So I'm just asking you to, if you could take a word back from Oregon pronunciation and <laughs> you could pronounce it the way it was spelled, which word would it be? I'm going to take the obvious one because it's the only one I can think of. <laughs> Go on. Cooch. That's right. It's couch. Cooch Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's spelled like couch. That's the obvious answer. And so we should pronounce it couch. Yeah. But it's cooch, which just sounds <laughs> sexual. Uh, well, Julia, what about <laughs> you? So I live on Holiday Street, but it's like holiday. So mm -hmm. every time I say it out mm. loud, they misspell it three times and then we finally get to my address. So it's just mm -hmm. like a little bit of an irritating thing. But I also wonder how it's pronounced. I've never looked into that. If you actually emphasize the holla in the day. Holiday? Yeah. <laughs> Sophie, do you know? Does anyone know? I always say holiday. Mm -hmm. Rather than holiday. How, wait, how else would you say it? Not emphasizing the A in the middle. Holiday, you know? Holiday. Rather than holiday. <laughs> Does that mm. make sense? I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> now we're all confused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for playing, you guys. That was basically it. Um, Sophie, you know the rules. Guests go first. And even though you're you're always on here... And you're one of us now. You're still our guest. What's your headline of the week? 
Um, my headline of the week is Multnomah County leaders drop ball on helping Portland launch well-run mass outdoor shelter for homeless. So this was a story published uh, on August 7th, so earlier this week by the Oregonian. And it's sort of the latest in the saga between Multnomah County and the city of Portland. So as many people know, the city of Portland and you know, our understanding is that it came from Mayor Ted Wheeler's office is that they wanted to set up six mass sanctioned campsites with the end goal of basically eradicating homelessness in Portland. And so Mm -hmm. they were going to have up to, I think it's capacity of 150 or 200 people a piece in each of these, these six campsites. There's only one location that's been secured. They've got a provider, but you know, the, the County and the city for many, many years, at least under former Multnomah County chair, Deborah Kafori had a very frosty relationship with the city and then Jessica Vega Peterson got elected and she took office January 1st of this year and her and Ted Wheeler have sort of at least publicly have made it seem like they're really a united front and they're going to collaborate much better than Wheeler did with Kafori. And for over six months, JVP, Jessica Vega Peterson, has sort of made these kind of squishy statements about the county pledging to provide sort of these wraparound services at these campsites. Mm -hmm. Because the the county is the mental health provider. And so they're the ones that really have kind of the arsenal of like behavioral health providers, mental health providers, sort of these wraparound services for the people who are supposed to be in these camps. And so for many months, you know, JVP has sort of said publicly like, oh, we'll do this. We'll provide those wraparound services. And what the Oregonian reported essentially is that there's been no substance behind that. So the O, you know, had gotten some documents that basically showed that the city for months has been trying to peg kind of the county on this and pin them down and say, hey, what are you actually going to provide? And the county's provided nothing material. I think I think the thing that stuck out to maybe most readers in this is that the one thing that they concretely provided was like one time pet food. Um, <laughs> yeah, I said that. Services. Oh and so, gosh. you know, it's interesting because I think for since the beginning of the year, like a lot of people sort of in these political spheres and I guess the public in general has wondered, like, is the city and county relationship going to be different than it was a year ago? Because we were sort of promised that. And, you know, JVP sort of ran her campaign on that, is that I'm going to work better with the city than my predecessor did. And here we are, you know, eight months into the year, and we're seeing sort of the same pattern of kind of squishy promises that, you know, don't really manifest. So um, it's, you know, it's a bummer, but it's also, it's interesting politically. Well, the first thing that I uh, noted was that there was no follow-up whatsoever from the county. There's no why, and that's so unsatisfying. And also there's a bit of, what's the word? Arrogance? Like, the, mm. I would find it arrogant if someone was like, hey, I'm going to do this thing for you. And it was a big project. And it's like, well, that's like half of the, you know, like, OK, because I mean, this is huge. And here's the thing is the shelters did launch in July. And now because of that, the city had a scramble. And it's like Care Oregon and Halfshear Oregon, which, by the way, wonderful organization. All these organizations came together to help the city provide these services that the county said, hey, not only do we have the money for this, but we have the the infrastructure to help put this together. They didn't do it. And that's the other thing. They have money. Mm-hmm. So much so that there was actually an article put out a few months ago about their underspending for like all of their homeless plans that they're supposed to be doing. I don't know. You know, I think, um, I mean, obviously the county has really underspent and, you know, Metro, the regional government recently is trying to put them under basically a compliance plan because they're so, you know, they're underspending their money so badly and the county's pretty much like, "Mm, we don't want to do that. But I think you're right, Claudia, is that it's hard to get a straight answer from the county about why they're not doing these things. And it just feels like such a hangover from the prior administration. Yeah. I also wonder too, just thinking about how people are feeling on the ground at these sites or at this site, If you're a worker trying to provide these services to the people who are there staying in the shelter and you don't have clear long-term answers for them, I can't imagine how frustrating that is because you're there already doing a pretty tough job wanting to feel like you're confident in what your answers are uh, for people who are going through a tough time. And Mm -hmm. you're saying, well, this is how it may be for now, or actually we don't have this even though we promised this to you coming into it. And that's heartbreaking. I think that's unacceptable. Um, on so many levels and can add to just the the burnout of 
working in that environment and the burnout of for people who are staying there, um, uprooting their lives to go and, and consider this their home for now. Yeah. It's sort of ironic too. That's a good point, Julia, because you know, the county has always been about wraparound services. You know, that's how we get people out of homelessness. You can't just stick them in like a, a campsite and expect that they're going to be fine. Like that is the county's sort of bread and butter. At least, you know, that's what they say is their bread and butter. And here they are not providing the very services that they say are the only thing that's going to help people get out of this. So they are leaving them high and dry. And like, mm-hmm. that's what the county has all this money for. And that's what they say is like, what they're best at. And yet here they are not providing the very service that they say they're the most equipped to provide. So it's sort of ironic. Yeah. So Shane Dixon Cavanaugh is the reporter whose article we are basing our conversation from. And uh, he was just on the show last week. Hey, Shane, if you're listening. But um, (laughs) something that I noted that he reported on was that there was a memo that was circulating to city and county officials showing that the joint office had started looking for potential housing navigation uh, providers only two weeks prior everything happening. And that that, even at that point, they had yet to identify, you know, who was going to be on the behavioral mental health uh, side of things. And that was, you know, from like, what do we call him? Vega Peterson's, you call it her JVP? JVP. (laughs) JVP's chief of staff. Um, And all I could think of is like, okay, did they maybe not think the city was going to get it together? Because I didn't think so. Do you think mm. they were just like, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if this happens. And then it happened and they're like, oh, man, did anyone get started on that? No, I didn't think he w- I didn't think Wheeler was going to be able to do this. Oh, my God. <laughs> if I wrote the, you know, the painful sitcom that would be the city of Portland, that's what would have happened in that storyline. Mm-hmm. Is that the city came through with something that the county had no clue that they would be able to again guys this is me writing this story this is not what's been reported or what is the fact (laughs) but i'm just saying that to me is the only thing that makes sense other than like because them just not doing anything and being like yeah you know didn't do it not Mm -hmm. even sorry or whatever but just like no reason why and we didn't do it it's fishy for sure well uh, it's just interesting to see that the city didn't drop the ball and that it's actually the county this time (laughs) sorry because it's always the opposite you know you're just like so interesting yeah you're just like why can't the city do anything it's like they did something and now they are all there alone just holding the line and it hurts my heart all right let's take a quick break here and when we come back more headlines of the week well julia what is your headline of the week Thank you. So my headline is from The Argonian. Uh, This story was written by Maxine Bernstein. And it's talking about the fact that there were dozens more wrongful convictions uncovered as a result of the DMV not properly keeping their records um, involving license suspensions. So as of right now, more than six dozen people were wrongfully convicted of driving with a suspended license in Washington and Clackamas counties. And back in February, the Oregonian actually reported that the DMV was improperly recording about 3,000 driver's license in the last two decades, which is why the district attorney in both counties started looking into it. And what the issue was, was that the DMV was putting in like a, a filler date as to when the license will be suspended along the lines of like 0000. So when um, police officers would pull people over, they would see that um, either licenses were suspended indefinitely or for an extreme amount of time, um, Mm -hmm. and they could have been arrested on the spot. Didn't someone go to jail for a year, like for over a year for this? Yeah, that's that's definitely one of the things that's being looked into at this point. It's just um, kind of embarrassing. It's pretty bad. Yeah. And I, you know, I think we've seen sort of this pattern with state agencies is that the, their response when they've, when they've realized what they've done has just been really, it's not been transparent. There's been a huge delay. We know that, you know, like the governor and, you know, other top legislators have been like aware of these things, like the DMV, the recent DMV hack. I mean, that was a huge deal. Like we know the governor knew days before the public knew that, you know, a lot of people's information had been had been compromised and yet we're not told. And so I think it's just sort of another, it's another example of a state agency sort of withholding pretty important information with, I think the intent of like, 
kind of formulating its, I, I guess, PR around it or how they're going to kind of spin this thing or how they're going to make it a little bit more palatable when I think it, you know, when there's reporting done on sort of this delay of when it happened and actually when we figured it out, I think it does a lot more harm than good. At this point, um, the Clackamas County District Attorney's Office found a total of 30 wrongful convictions, 18 felony, and 12 misdemeanor prosecutions. After it reviewed nearly 6,000 uh, driving suspension convictions from 2010 through April of this year. And this is not even to mention so many of the people that have warrants out for an arrest as of right now. So they're having to very quickly contact those people to let them know that they've made a mistake. Oh, my God. So, OK, so I looked it up and it was Nicholas Chappelle. He spent nearly a year at Snake River Correctional Institution uh, after he was arrested and convicted for driving with a suspended license, which was, of course, as we now know, caused by an mm -hmm. oopsie daisy, an admin oopsie daisy. This man, it's so sad. He basically just never questioned the charge. He relied yeah. on his defense lawyer. He pleaded guilty because he was like, well, this is obviously wrong and it'll get sorted out. And then like, I don't know if y'all mm. have seen the movie Brazil, but just like the, <laughs> like the movie Brazil, <laughs> like, because I don't know. So the whole point of Brazil is that it's loosely based on Kafka's The Trial. And this man named Ed Edward Tuttle or whatever, he, someone, you can see in the beginning, someone misspells Tuttle mm. in somewhere. And this, it starts a chain of events where this innocent guy is brought in uh, for some other charges. They think he's like a terrorist or something. And it's so similar where just like someone somewhere was like, oops. And it's like, oh, now you're in jail for a year. Mm -hmm. Can you believe? And the fact that he couldn't fight it because he probably didn't have the money for a better lawyer and he just had to like rely on whatever the defense they gave him. He supposedly lost a job as a union iron worker. That's so hard to get. Oh he missed his, the birth of his son. Like just so much stuff all because somebody at the DMV just didn't wasn't paying attention. I don't know. I feel like the DMV should be sorrier. I didn't even, <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's not anything like, oh no, oh, I'm so sorry. This is how we're going to fix it. It's just like, yeah, we're looking into it. Yeah. I can't imagine the stories that <laughs> like, will be coming out of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You would expect someone to be like, hey, this happened. Here are the things you would want, you know, to get ahead of. And this is how we're going to fix it. Like get well soon cards to all the people wrongfully convicted. So. <laughs> get well soon. That's exactly <laughs> what I would want if I was wrongfully convicted. Get well soon. Mental health, uh, financial hit, family, relations, all that. I hope that all sorts itself. Get well soon. <laughs> I think it's just... Shocking to hear, too, that this was happening over the past two decades from what they know. And no one said anything. You would think at some point someone would say, okay, why did the last four people I've pulled over have a 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 date in their license <laughs> suspension? Like, when does yeah. that get alarming? Or is that just a thing? I, I have no idea, but I mean. Yeah, yeah. You're saying, like, if the police pulled over and they saw a ridiculous, like, Mayan yeah. calendar date that they exactly. should be like. <laughs> But what if it's just a yes or no on their end, and they're just like, mm, and it's just like, point. you know, kind mm. of like the Terminator, and it's just like, you see your little <laughs> face, and then there's just a little zero, you know, like a, a red circle and a little slash, and it just says jail, jail. And that's all mm -hmm. they see. So they can't use their critical function skills. Could be. Because Could be. They, they're just, it's a yes or no thing. It's binary. It's like, no jail, jail. Yeah, this, this leaves a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm just saying that's the only way this could continue. Obviously, that's the only thing that makes sense. Yeah, well, I, I hope that everyone who has been affected by that gets uh, compensation. Oh, yeah, and and then some. I'm sure lawsuits will follow. Oh, and yeah. I can't see a world in which they won't. And I hope they get them all. <laughs> um, my headline this week is also from the Oregonian. Jeez Louise, the Oregonian just killing it this week. Um, so the chief of police sent an all office email, like an all office memo back in May to his reportees telling them all to stop bad mouthing district attorney, Mike Schmidt, and just Portland in general. And this is something that I think we've all kind of felt in our hearts about the police department, <laughs> that they've been passing a lot of blame of what's going on in this city to other people, you know, people that are mm -hmm. more downstream than them. Let's just put it that way. So I don't know if you guys have known, known this, but 
it was known to, I think, a lot of reporters and a lot of people who follow the news, but you could never really pinpoint who was saying it because nobody was reporting it because, again, it was never going on paper. So even so we mm -hmm. just had, you know, the district attorney, Mike Schmidt, on the show. And and even I couldn't explain to him without it sounding like a uh, conjecture, you know, like, oh, this is some random thing. But we we've all know that the police have been telling people. Like, it's, this is just in the know in the city. They've been like, hey, the reason we don't make arrests is because the DA doesn't want to prosecute them. <laughs> that is a thing they've been saying to people, like yeah. to actual victims of crimes. And finally, the chief of police was like, guys, can you stop doing that? One, it's not true. <laughs> like, two, you're ruining our relationship with the DA. Mm. And three, like... You're ruin. You're like lying to the people, and you're going to ruin that relationship as well. It's so interesting. It's like the the police, the Portland Police Bureau. You know, I mean, I think police bureaus in general they're so insular. Mm -hmm. There's rarely reporting on cracks within the bureau. You know, obviously, like once you get outside of the bureau, like the Portland Police Bureau has tiffs here and there with other, you know, entities and whatever. But like, rarely do you see sort of an internal crack in the mm -hmm. police bureau because they are so. They're very unified, you know, like they are, they come off as a unified front and police chief Chuck Lavelle, like he's been, we haven't ever really seen him or at least I haven't. And maybe that's not fair, but at least publicly, I haven't seen him really call out his own force on, on anything. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first time that we've seen him sort of being like, no, you know, st stop with this narrative. Cause it's not true. Like that, that to me was really striking. It was unexpected. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just didn't think the police chief in Portland would do that, basically tell his ranks, like, hey, this is hurting the reputation of the police bureau and it's untrue. Like, I don't know, it, it made me think of Chuck Lavelle in a slightly different light in which mm -hmm. I hadn't, you know, seen him before. Yeah, that's true. And it's funny too, I, I wonder in the meantime, what a lot of these officers were thinking the outcome was going to be. Like if you are spreading the rumor that charges are not being pressed, then ultimately your job is just going to get harder because things on the streets are going to get more out of control because people are going to think they have more um, leeway to kind of do whatever and, and not be not face the consequences of their crimes. So it, it like ultimately comes back around and bites them in the butt for this rumor that they started. And I can't help but think about the episode we just put out with Mike Schmidt, Claudia, the one that you referenced, because he literally laid out this visual of like a baton race where mm -hmm. he had said that if, if officers aren't arresting people, then then he literally can't do his job. I don't think cops are the ones that originated this idea of because the DA is not prosecuting, we're not going to arrest. I don't think the cops like I think they believe that. I think a lot of them believe that. And I don't think it started with them. And I don't know where it started. I mean, I think People for Portland has run a very successful <laughs> yeah. campaign and has really pushed that narrative that, like, it's because Schmidt's not prosecuting that cops aren't doing anything. And I think cops have sort of, like, bought into that narrative. I don't think they're, like, the ones that really started this whole thing. What I will say is, like, I mean, I, you know, the cops are incorrect that, like, it, it's it's the DA choosing not to prosecute. But I will say, like... We do have an understaffed police bureau and there are, you know, there are very small changes within like the standards for proving something like the police have to do a lot of the brunt work in order to bring a case to the DA that they are able to say, yeah, we think we can prosecute this person. Mm -hmm. So if that brunt work isn't done and a lot of these cops will say whether it's correct or not, like we don't have the personnel to be able to prove all these things that you need us to prove in order to take on this case. So like... The narrative itself isn't accurate, but it is accurate that, like, you you know, cops have to do the majority of the work if the DA is going to take on a case. Right. And I also just want to clarify that they are understaffed, but they are not underfunded. And I feel like there is a narrative also totally. that, that we defunded the cops and it's like, no, if you look at the numbers, they've had the most funding. I mean, they got more funding after George Floyd because of all the stress that the police bureau um, had to withstand from, you know, all the protests that they had to be physically present at but mm -hmm. anyhow i just wanted to say that out loud for anyone mm -hmm. who was just like well we should give them more money it's like no they're under staff for different reasons and that's morale and it's people not wanting to be cops anymore <laughs> and it's people who left and it's like a, a bigger it's a bigger issue it's a bigger like culture issue than the, us just throwing money at them but i'm also just confused by what's going on in the ranks if there's that much you know misunderstanding 
within the the police force, if they're so unified, why is this narrative just now them being like, hey, guys, can we stop? Because the, I, what I'm reading is the only reason that the chief sent out this memo was because he was just getting an insane amount of reports from city residents who were just disappointed by their interactions with the Portland police officers, basically coming to them and saying, it just sounds like they've given up. Mm. Like they're not like. At my lowest point, they came, someone broke into my house, and they basically told me, like, you know, tough luck, coconut, you know? <laughs> 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 like, and just, like, moseyed on. And it's like, what's the, what, what's the point of that, you know? I don't know. It just seems like something that um, they're going to have to take care of inside. Like, I, I just don't understand how the city's going to fix this or how the county or anyone's going to go in. This seems like a, a problem for Portland Police Chief Chuck Lovell to sort out between his own ranks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense. But yeah, I'm just curious how all this is going to affect our DA Mike Schmidt as he as he runs again, because one of his deputies is now trying to step up, take his job and basically mm -hmm. pointing to all the things that all the rumors that are being spread around that were, you know, on that billboard that uh, people of Portland bought and um, that the police themselves were trying to um, also make true uh, that he's not doing anything. And so I'm just wondering how all this is going to shake out. Mm -hmm. He must have felt validated by this report. He's like, yeah, they are doing that. Like, I could imagine him <laughs> being like, finally. He's like, somebody. wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Before we leave, does anyone have a, an uplifting story to share so we don't walk away from this this conversation with, like, our, our cities on fire yet again? I'm thinking really hard right now. Okay, well, thanks, you guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. I hope things are better next week. <laughs> Someone make good news so we can, so we can share it. <laughs> thanks, Claudia. <laughs> we'll do better next time. <laughs> That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thank you so much for listening. Our lead producer is John Atariani. Our audio producers this week were Julia Fiaioni and Lizzie Goldsmith. Our newsletter editor is Rachel Monahan, and our host is me, Claudia Meza. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Drizos. Additional music by All the Kimonos and Epidemic Sound. We'll be back Monday morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>